And in more recent times, Descartes is the most famous philosopher to have supported the idea of dualism. So he believed that there are two separate substances. There's a, sep there's a substance of the mind and there's a substance of the body. And somehow these two interact through the pineal gland in the back of the brain, but that they're essentially two separate entities completely. And this goes back, as I said, for thousands of years. And if we then follow this philosophical movement through the West, um, towards the end of the 19th century, the ideas of a number of eminent philosophers, including Descartes, ultimately led to a separate a branching out, and Chris will correct me if I'm wrong, and certainly we can discuss it at the panel discussion, an essential branching out of a new subject, which was essentially the study of the mind, psychology. And early psychologists became interested in trying to develop a, a more objective way of studying the human mind and consciousness. And it started out by an introspectionist movement where people started to look at their own thought processes to see how they think and why they think they do, the way they do. Others then developed a branch called behavior psychology where they started to study human behavior and particularly moved on then to animal behavior because they felt it was too difficult to study human behavior. So they would study the behavior of, say, rats or dogs, and the most famous is Pavlov's experiment with his dogs. Um, and they tried to understand why people behave the way that they do and the similarities with the animal kingdom. And there are other movements within psychology who have become interested in this, the most notable of which is psychoanalysis, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a moment, but also areas such as cognitive psychology and evolutionary psychology. And evolutionary psychologists believe that everything that we have, all our behavior, comes through evolution. And so it's built in through the evolutionary process as, as uh, through that. What I'd like to do, though, I'm not going to have time to go through any more detail for, for the psychological theories, but just to say that you can see how this idea has transitioned through. But probably the most interesting model of the self that is talked about is that of Freud's model, the psychoanalytical model um, of the self and consciousness. Now, I think Freud must have been a genius because I don't know as I think so was Aristotle, as I think so was Plato. Because when you look back and you think, how did they come with the ideas they came out with? I don't know if you know, but Aristotle really was an amazing scientist. He was the first person who divided the whole classification system we have in biology. It's come about from Aristotle's work. He realized that human beings learn things through classification. And so he classified things, living beings around himself. And I think Freud must have been a genius because he somehow figured out something amazing. He wasn't the only person. The idea was developing at his time, but I think he's the most well-known person to have done this. And he realized through um, work being done um, in hypnosis um, in Paris when he was a young medical student that there must be something unconscious about our mind. There's something that we're not aware of. And he came to this conclusion by watching people being hypnotized. So, for example, one lady had been hypnotized by Charcot, I believe, who was a French physician. And um, he told this lady that at 1 o'clock, I think, uh, when the clock turns to 1 o'clock, you're going to get up and open the window. And shortly as it happened, at 1 o'clock, this lady stood up after she'd been hypnotized and she opened the window. And so Freud suddenly thought, well, why is she doing this? And when, they then, when she came out of a state of hypnosis and they asked her, well, why did you do that? She, in her own mind, had justified her actions by saying that I felt too warm and that's why I opened the window. So Freud concluded there must be something that's unconscious within us that drives a lot of our behavior. And that ultimately led to his theory of the self, which is that the majority of it is, and as we'll see in a moment, is in the unconscious state. And he believed that our behavior is all pretty much instinctive. So we're born with certain instincts, and by the time of our late childhood, early adolescence, that's the time that we learn everything, and we don't have any more learning after that. And that all our actions come from our instincts. So he described that instinctive part of our being as the id, which is in the red, which looks more brown or purple. I'm sorry for the projection. Um, and he believed that it's a bit like you can think of as a small child who's only interested in satisfying its desires instantaneously, or an animal that wants what it wants there and then. And that's where these instincts come from. And it leads to all the tendencies we have, you know, whether it be aggression or any other instinctive behavior that human beings have. On the other hand, through interaction with society, with our parents, with school, with other children as we grow up, there's another component to the mind or, or the psyche um, that he called the superego, which is essentially our moral conscience. It learns through interaction through society what behavior is appropriate and what behavior isn't appropriate. And I think of it very much as how you might train a dog. You know, eventually you can train a dog 
to learn what is right and what is wrong and how it should behave. And so I think that's kind of conceptually what he thought. And in between, of, between the two of those, different, so that the superego being a bit like a braking system on the instincts. And between that, you have the ego, which is a seat of reason. And it's the duty of the ego to try to decide what to do at any one time. And it develops itself through interaction through society. So, for example, a judge um, may have certain instincts. Let's say a case comes up and their instinct is that for their own self-preservation, it's good to rule in one way. And then they have a superego that's been trained by society that tells them, no, no, you should rule in this particular way. And then it's their ego that decides in between what is the best thing to do and chooses a course of action as it's been trained through society. So just to highlight that, we're essentially driven, according to Freud, by all our instincts all the time, and it's the role of the superego to try to act as some kind of barrier, and the ego, or our reasoning, tries to decide which one it should do at any one time. And so essentially, according to, to Freud, that is who we are. That's our mind. That's our consciousness. It's made of these three different large com components, and a lot of lo large part of it is in the unconscious. I think this is amazing, as I said, although if you th think about it, there are certain problems with this, and many people have criticized Freud's theories. A lot of people have criticized this theory that, that essentially limits human development and learning up to you know, the end of your childhood, which of course cannot be correct because we're learning all the time. But I think another problem with this is that you see that, again, we have certain behaviors that are not all in instinctive. We certainly have large instincts, and that's a large part of the way we behave. But we also have, as I pointed out earlier, an aspect that seems to be able to transcend all of that. So, for example, if this theory was correct, why would anyone do anything altruistic for someone else? Right? Why, it doesn't make any sense. If you're only driven by your instincts, why would anyone do anything good? Why would anyone have any virtue? It doesn't make a lot of sense at all. But it is a very interesting, interesting model. Another problem with it is that, and just not a problem, but just to bear in mind, although it's interesting and it works to a certain extent as a model, there is nowhere in the brain that corresponds to any of these faculties. There's not like a part of the brain that goes, oh, here's the ego, here's the id. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. And just to point out, so for him, the majority of um, our uh, sense is in the unconscious, as he concluded from the experiments being done. Now, interestingly, I then came across, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, one of the predominant view systems in the works of different people has been...